afternoon. My name is Anna and this is Ricardo. And together we have a design studio called Manufatura Independent. Uh, in this talk we will uh, try to explain a bit um, about a series of workshops that we started in 2013. And since then we've been doing them in different places and each time iterating on the process <laughs> of what we do during the workshop. So the workshop is called Type Bits, and what, what we wanted when we, we started building this workshop was to, to do a workshop where people would design a font together, that it would be uh, open to anyone, so you didn't have to be a designer, and you could be there and learn how to design a typeface, that we would go through all the steps that are involved in font creation, and that in the end we would have a finished font that you could use. Um, and we thought about this kind of workshop because we had our own experience of doing type design workshops where we would spend a lot of time discovering new things or exploring type, uh, type font editors, but we would end the workshop without having produced the finished something. And also our own experience doing type workshops uh, before and the problems that we had to deal with and and so this, that's how we started. And we had a set of principles for the, the workshop. So we decided to go with a grid-based grid uh, typeface design because uh, we wanted the workshop to work for everyone, either designers or, or not designers. And vector outline fonts are harder to design. So designing within a grid is a good constraint. Also a good constraint if you want to get uh, if you're getting creative and you have a lot of decisions and possibilities to explore and the grid helps you focus a bit more on what kind of thing you will do. Uh, so we went with, with the grid and we, we decided the workshop would be aimed at designing uh, bitmap fonts. Uh, they're also, they also make it easy to understand the different parts that compose uh, typeface like the x height, the descendants, the ascendants, and this is also a part that can take up quite a large chunk of a type design workshop, which is introducing type design in general, because it's a very complex subject, and by going with this kind of approach, we were able to make it much quicker. Yes, because I also forgot to mention, this workshop uh, usually has a duration of three to four hours, and in that very short amount of time, we start from scratch and we end up with one or more fonts, depending on the number of people that are participating. The grid is also a good restriction to, to have consistency in the typeface, because it's easy to maintain the width of the, of the lines and the curves, and that's really important when you're doing a typeface together with other people. Uh, so we start uh, using only pen and paper, and that's also a very important thing we, we found, because if you go into the computer, then you have all sorts of things that you can get distracted with. So we just have paper and pen, and everyone starts drawing individually, and we go from there. Paper also makes it very easy to share the, the designs that you're doing. It's, you can just... Uh, show the paper and it's pretty easy, no need to send files or connect your laptop to, um, to any kind of device. Uh, paper also was our way to deal with, uh, with version control because when you have a lot of people working together in the same project, you need to have some kind of system to organize the collaboration and to organize the process. So with paper, we were able to create this kind of uh, analog uh, version control and it was also a good way to introduce people to things like Git. Uh, it's a very soft way to let them know how to uh, pick a letter that they want to draw and not having anyone else drawing the same character and also knowing who is doing what and what's already done and what's missing. So that's how we do it. Uh, we go through several quick rounds of drawing. 
We start with people drawing individually and then as we go we have to make decisions on directions until we get to a phase where we, we put people together in groups and then they develop a single typeface together. So we start with people drawing letters individually, we pick some directions and then from there we try to consolidate on a direction. It's really hard to, to make decisions because it's not very objective uh, what would be the best choice when you're presented with a set of possibilities that people just draw very quickly. And so we, we have some discussion with the participants where we see what each person has done and why they decided to do something or not. And then uh, in most cases, because we have large groups, me and Ricardo take the the paper of the benevolent dictator for life. So we take the responsibility of making the hard choice and we say mm. to people when we can't reach a consensus quickly which direction we will take. And we have no problem with that because it's the goal of the workshop to go from uh, scratch to finished font in very short time. And we know that in the end, the font that we published is an open font, so anyone can go back to it and do whatever they want that they didn't have the chance to do in the workshop. And it's something that comes from free software, which is uh, a field that we're close to, so we just borrow this uh, methodology. Uh, we, we have people drawing together in groups as we, we go uh, through the process. And it's really nice because they can, they can show each other what they're drawing on paper and discuss. And from there, we, we go through all the steps. So after drawing everything on paper, we go through the digitizing process, then spacing, publishing the font, uh, doing the font log, uh, having the license, and then if there's time, also working on a type specimen, which is always a very uh, gratifying thing. And so these are some photos of the, the letters. And in all the process, we use only free and open source tools. We will go into further detail uh, a little bit ahead. And the fonts that we, that we do in the workshops, they're always released under the open font license. Uh, while doing these workshops, we also, in a way, went uh, through this path of trying alternate font editors to design typefaces. So from our experience before, we had, we had a really hard time installing software in, everyone, in all the participants' computers at the beginning of a workshop and that would take quite a lot of time. After that, we decided to try virtual machines. We had a good experience with it, but it was also a bit hard when, it come, when we come to the part of sharing the files that each person is working on and how we do that. And so, in a way, we, we came to this idea of working with a text editor. And it's been a really good experience because people are very familiar with this kind of interface so you just explain the rules that they need to follow when they are digitizing the drawing of the character and there's no interface scaring you or pushing you into trying something else because you just have this very specific and very clear task and it was a line that we really liked and we continued on exploring this idea of designing typefaces without a font editor these are some of the fonts that we did over the years. Um, well, of course, because our motto is release early, by the end of the workshop it needs to be out. We know there will be bugs, we know it won't be perfect, and that sometimes it's really hard when we have a majority of designers participating in the workshop. <laughs> but we, we force uh, people to, to just go ahead and you know, and deal with the fact that it's not perfect, but it exists. And that's already really nice. Okay, so um, I'm now going to move towards the more technical aspect of how um, we go from the paper designs into the digitizing process and the font generation. And 
where we were led to after iterating over the years on different um, different ways of working. Um, so um, everything that I'm going to talk about, and also most of the points that Anna made, are actually on a documentation website that we will we'll share the URL with you uh, in the end. But uh, where it all started, so. Um, this was, uh, this was one of our starting points for our current uh, tool chain, which is the Graphicore Bitmap Font Building uh, Framework, built by Lasse Fister, who is uh, it's over there, um, and who we couldn't yet thank uh, enough for coming up with, uh, with, this nice, uh, with this fantastic library, which is pretty much uh, a new font, uh, I don't know how new it is, but with a, a particular font format where uh, each glyph of a bitmap font is described in a text file in ASCII art. So in that format, like dots are empty spots, uh, the hash characters are the field spots. And uh, each one lives on its own text file. Um, and um, additionally, uh, it comes with a really useful generator that picks these text files. If you've laid them out correctly and took care of the metadata, which is still a bit complex, but uh, we'll get to that. Uh, you can actually generate several weights, um, so not only can you build like the, the usual, like the free as in freedom, so that's like the simple um, output uh, with little squares as the pixels, but then you can come up with these uh, uh, fantastic variations. Um, and this, this was a, kind of a revelation for us um, to begin working around and building our uh, pipeline around. So um, one of our problems as well in these workshops, so we started using this, but um, we always needed like half an hour at the end of the workshop to get everyone's files, uh, put them on our system, run uh, the build command, hope that everything gets built, um, and then push it um, back to, uh, put it online, document it by hand, um, and that was kind of a, a bit of friction in the process that we tried to solve. Um, we all also used Git um, in, in our own computer. We would pass out a USB stick um, so, so that people could copy their text files. Um, and then we, put them, we would put them together. This, this was really, I mean, it worked. Um, but it was really stressful because then you had really anxious people wanting to see their fonts. And you're like, mm, sorry. I mean, this will take a bit. So we um, refined our process and came to something that we are kind of really happy about and wanted to share. Um, so again, in this line of we would really like people not to touch a font editor. Um, so we tried our hand at using GitLab, um, which uh, for its various features became a really useful uh, tool for us. Um, so. A font repository comes with a folder with uh, the glyphs, and each text file is a letter. And the cool thing is, like, GitHub and GitLab have this browser editor. Um, you can edit text files directly there. So you can actually edit the characters in the browser itself, which was excellent for us. Like Anna mentioned, we were struggling a lot with getting people to use, uh, to be able to run a font editor. That took up a lot of the initial time. Even with virtual machines, which were a really great uh, tool for workshops because they make sure that everyone is running the same thing. But first, you have to get people to, to, to download the virtual machine uh, software, whatever it is, to download the virtual machine itself or pass it around and by means of it being at least like, two gigabytes um, in size. It takes a lot of time in the beginning of the workshop. Right here then, everyone just needs a laptop with a with the browser and they can actually work on the on the typeface. So what we do is we create a skeleton entity repository that then people go in and fill out, as you see, like it's the glyphs slash the g.txt file. So they just go through each one and it's really easy to explain this way. Um, so uh, one of the things that we recently, like last year, took uh, to make was documenting all this process uh, and also the technical framework. And one of the things that we are also working on is uh, documenting the font format itself, uh, which is um, getting there, and, um, but it's still a bit of uh, work that we need to do. But if you're curious about it, we are uh, documenting it besides the documentation that you will find uh, in, the, in the original package. 
But um, we use a lot more, uh, we like using, went beyond just using GitLab as a version control system. Um, because um, we realized that another source of friction was generating the font files and then we commit them to the repository so people can download them. That's fine, but it requires manual work, so we would have to run the program like the generator, we still had to do that. Yeah. Pull the repository at the end of the workshop, run everything, hope for the best, and then recommit that. Um, so we solved the problem of the USB sticks, but we still had the last minute uh, dependence on ourselves to finish things. But then uh, we started reading about this really cool thing called continuous integration, um, which um, I see cringing from part of the audience, um, but. Uh, it can be a huge field, but basically, and a very layman's explanation, is um, if you have a Git repository, um, on every commit, um, do something. Usually that's done to test your software package, like to run uh, tests every time someone makes the changes to make sure that nothing broke, or if something broke, it just emails you right away instead of you finding it about that a year later. Um, but um, you can use it to build like packages for, from your website, build the binaries, but um, essentially you can run anything on continuous integration pipelines. So basically you can, you can put in what, whatever collection of tasks and um, things to do that you, can, uh, that you want. And uh, GitLab, um, I suppose GitHub has similar stuff, but we're, we, we're sticking to GitLab. Um, they are pretty okay with us posting like a Docker file, um, and and again, we're thankful enough to have friends who understand Docker, um, because we certainly don't. Um, well, it's not that hard, uh, terrible to understand. So this is basically a, a Docker file for GitLab to tell what the continuous integration should look like. So what we do is. Basically, it creates a new computer in GitLab server, installs the dependencies, and runs stuff. So um, we decide, okay, so it installs all the dependencies, it installs like FontForge, which is used uh, behind the scenes to generate the font. Um, and then it generates the font itself in GitLab's computers, not on ours anymore. And it does that on every single change. So someone changes uh, a letter and they click OK on the GitLab um, interface, it gets committed and it gets built immediately into a font file. And um, so yeah, you get like this terminal um, from the GitLab interface that's running your pipeline. And in the end you get what they call artifacts, which are the generated files. So not only do we generate the, the TTF, FD and OTF file, but we also make like this mini specimen uh, with FontForge, um, I think it's called Font Image, the program that shows you the whole characters. Uh, and that brings us to a really um, nice uh, automatically generated readme um, that comes with like this tiny specimen, the font downloads that link to the canonical links of the artifacts, they have like a fixed link, and so as they get generated, everything gets um, updated to um, to the most recent version. Um, and uh, I'm pretty much about to end. Um, the last thing um, that we have been also working on in this, uh, on this pipeline, well, so far, this really makes our work completely uh, uh, painless because now we don't have to generate anything. We can just keep going until like the last minute, the last minute of the workshop and we can still insert new stuff and it get gets built by GitLab in a minute, and then the font is downloadable. Um, and this is a pipeline that we're really excited about. It took a few years to fine tune and um, a lot of support by, by friends and organizations who invited us uh, to, to do these workshops and test these principles and also helped us like for the Docker stuff. And um, so now what we, the most recent one was um, there's actually a, a specimen page, so we included a HTML basic website with CSS and all that. Um, finishing, um, and it also gets built with the pipeline. So um, as soon as you start font and you start working on it, 
Actually, if you fork our fonts, and you'll find them on the URL that I'm showing you here right now, um, if you fork them, you get all, all of this for free. So you can actually go in there, uh, fork one of the fonts that I was showing, um, change some characters, and your fork will generate all of this for yourself. Which um, we found as we were showing this was pretty precious to have uh, such uh, an autonomous pipeline for building fonts. Again, we're not um, designing fonts for, um, for, I mean, these are a bit like fonts for uh, teaching, for educational reasons, like Anna outlined. And we're interested more than producing the tight uh, typefaces with all the checkboxes ticked. We're really more interested in how uh, can we still design typefaces, but avoid um, some of what we think are kind of the, the kinks in the type design process, namely, uh, in this case, specialized um, software to, to make typefaces. So, um, yeah, this is pretty much um, it. So this uh, is our documentation website, which we are still building up, but you can find more if you're interested in the little details. So there's stuff like, uh, I didn't talk about like, the template for a new font, if you want to generate it, there is a command line uh, tool that you can just run, so it generates the base of the font and you can just do a workshop like we did, uh, and uh, a lot more stuff. So if you're curious about the, the, the process behind the, the workshop, behind beyond what you mentioned, that's the website. And that's, uh, thank you for your attention.